Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval French libraries for our medieval French playlist. I started like last year focusing a bit more on this country given that um, we had somehow lagged behind in the previous years of Schwerpunkt. So starting from something general, then you know that I strengthen a bit the, the backbone with m some pulp. Um, but uh, sometimes even for German history, for Italian history, we get a bit more in that right with something um more more detailed but even there we should try to find something more uh robust to eventually fix all these uh, little insights that are not so little as you know but you know into something that you can follow more um more linearly um for france i pick sort of thematic background right in this case we talk about libraries and you see how randomly topics recur just the other day i was talking about carolingian manuscripts uh today we will delve into it um again and uh, picture in fact the impressive of course uh literary output that this country really um really provided with uh, the world with uh Mostly for focusing properly on the library itself, so not the literary production per se. We will get into the manuscript, into some kind of, um, you know, more specific, even proper work. There is the, the cycle of the of the lower names, for example, that I was about to make the video on, um, and covering a bit, of course, of the history of French literature. But the libraries here are kind of an interesting topic because we have observed how France, fundamentally in medieval Europe and beyond, is the prototype of the state as such, a minarchist of a monarchy that um, began to rule a bite through say, feudal means. So it what appears to be central, uh, decentralized, but still essentially from a center that would turn out to be properly there. And the, the crown in Paris, and so this kind of imperial dominance of, of the north on surrounding areas that were eventually to, to gradually build up the, the modern French uh, nation. We'll come back uh, on that topic. But the um, the ideology behind it, we've seen in many videos from the, in fact, uh, from Caesar Papism, the, 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 the imperial nature of the French monarchy, to uh, other videos about the Franks, Clovis, the Merovingians, etc. Without much ideologism, because um, one must give really the proper due to historical phenomena where you, you can't avoid to see a continuity, right? We will come back on that specific topic. But in order to keep together this a huge amount of people and, uh, and territory resources, uh, an adequate ideology spurring such imperial rule had to be affirmed, right? So the library, the the selection of the works, the, the, the knowledge, even just the tastes of uh, those who were at the top in different times of French history, sometimes also of kind of uh, disgregation, like the Hundred Years' War, etc., but still within French culture, how it had come to dominate fundamentally in the high medieval Europe, are always quite revealing, because they show we properly the face of this world, which is sometimes kind of a grimmer um, uh, face than you would think. Re that definitely there was a heavily hierarchical system where very few owned practically um, everything, uh, and the the communities of, of the realm were fundamentally just uh, sub Educated in during this process, probably with arms at some point, um, but also began to develop the awareness of the fitness of the system. Right, a system that, after all, did survive a remarkable crisis from properly the political fragmentation uh, followed to the Carolingian and the fall of the Carolingian Empire to the, the Hundred Years' War, right? So this is a bit typical with France, with the um, uh, confessional wars, with uh, with uh, with the French Revolution, etc. There are these big forces that agitate within that, and so it's important to see how the elite managed to 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 hold all this together successfully, 
right, in an incredibly successful way, because again, this this type of waves historically are very difficult to find in a single country, especially of this size, for it to, to remain standing, right? So France is in many ways a miracle of this political creation that should be also in, in a contemporary way reevaluated for appreciating the turn that French politics could take, right, for you know, spurring also a sense of imperial tradition in Europe, because definitely this was the country that in many ways embodied it uh, the most, even more than Germany, uh, if anything, because of the, the essentially the hegemonic military power that it acquired, right, and not, not even, in fact, the... Uh, the alternate uh, events, right, in, in the wars between France and unified Germany in, in the last couple hundred years really can um, can alter in, in the form, in fact, of a of, of a statal uh, solidity that reflects such unity of intent, right? So French history is really complex to tell because there is always a double face. I made a video recently about um, the... Uh, Say, the, the double faces of both modernity and tradition, because people tend to see this uh, as just straightforward, okay, we are traditionalists, okay, fine. You understood that there is something there, but, you know, uh, I still have a kind of dualistic view of, of reality without realizing, just without essentially even getting into it, uh, just as how it makes me feel. No, it, it, it doesn't work like that. Right. In every form of power, you have to explain not just why the power exists and, and is out there, but why um, uh, those who could have it lost it at some point. So you realize that this, this power flows to different channels that have nothing to do with the flag that you put on, the symbol you put on. It has to do with the actual effectiveness of this idea. And that's why, again, libraries also is the treasure of knowledge. Uh, and a bit the uh, the counterproof to, to all those prejudices and stereotypes uh, towards the, the Middle Ages that as allegedly dark ages where people didn't read, didn't travel, didn't communicate, were obscure, etc. Um, properly show the, the light of this um, universal tradition. You know that France is basically, and unsurprisingly in this sense, that will peaking uh, in medieval times among the various things, not just in military power, but in theological doctrine, right? Paris uh, University was the most important theological center in Europe, right? It was backed by, a, as we'll see now, also a, a great, right? If you know medieval philosophy, literature, a great... Um, say community a great amount of resources um, human and material alike to sustain the studies to have a higher culture surely centralized source uh, surely you know um, co-opted by the elites and guided by the mark in, in, in a word or another but still meaningful to maintain fundamentally the compass many things that uh, if you as you can see in my medieval Europe my medieval France playlist um, have are um, you know really made the, the politics right and and the and the military and the society of the time with really wide implications right this wasn't just France but it was a system always remember that where there were two universal authorities um, two universal powers and uh, technically in fact the, the secular one wasn't the earthly one was it wasn't even France herself in spite of her ambition but. Of course, that's the point that I'm making. How these formalities cannot hide power just for what it is. Right, so we will make uh, a brief history of the from the beginning to the end of medieval libraries in Gaul, France, later. So um, the, the, the first picture is naturally realizing that um, if we want to start talking about Middle Ages by approximation, have to look at the moment of decline of the um, educational structures of Roman civilization. So we're mostly talking about urban schools, this kind of uh, literate civic elite, right, that um, contracted brusquely uh, in, 
basically tr t together with the entire world civilization at the time. Um, and thus, um, also having to re-base uh, itself on a, on a different um, uh, local, political, and social sphere, right? With different knowledge, with different, um, not much with a different ideology, but that one that had to be updated for what had happened, right? With the end of the world empire, and of course all the implications, morally uh, speaking. So, I just made a video about the paradigm shift in late antiquity, the reaffirmation of the spiritual unity with Christendom, that fundamentally contrary. contrary that thing I was saying between modernity and tradition is not really uh, is the product of a decadence, but a decadence that had occurred independently from uh, from Christianity, which instead was pretty aware uh, in its Catholic meaning of the necessity of the reaffirmation of a spiritual unity that had the one for which the Roman Empire had by by losing had had, had broken down. Right, and in spite of the fact that the empire continued to exist, not just in Constantinople, but in general, in the view, of course, of all the Romano-Germanic world, and as what was meant to be reestablished and recovered and redeveloped, right? This was also a confused moment in, in some ways. And Gaul is a large country, so there are areas that have very different histories. Of course, Provence is not Armorica slash Brittany. Um, so, of course, um, Gaul represents, in late antiquity, actually, uh, southern Gaul, the most Romanized areas, Provence, uh, the Narbonensis, um, the, um, the, the greatest cultural center uh, in the West, right, in the West narrowly meant, like Western Europe, um, for many reasons. Right? We can look at the monastic libraries of centers like the one of the Lerun Island that, that um, uh, actually educated a very, very powerful, uh, a very powerful episcopate for the, the rule of still pretty big and alive cities like Arles, for example, or um, in you know, all the, the great centers that in the south remain fundamentally in spite of, of the contraction as a bit of the model, the example of that uh, Roman um, uh, education, which was needed naturally now to, to continue studying the, the history of what had happened to the world, to you know, uh, naturally being religiously literate, uh, and so on. Uh, you can find liber uh, libraries in the form of uh, zootecula, as they were called at the time, in the collections of privates. Um, of private figures, right, of some power and importance because manuscripts cost a lot, but it, it's very fascinating to look at this post-Roman goal in the late 6th, early 7th century where there were still this properly Roman um, intellectuals, or at least uh, Gallo-Roman intellectuals who um, still had their own treasure in the form of a library in their uh, homes somewhere, I don't know, in Auvergne or near to, to the Alps somewhere, and simply being there, right? We'd have Merovingian power was consolidating in the north, but them remaining fundamentally autonomous is still maintaining, as you know, in Occitania, the, uh, kind of a different uh, cultural identity in some, some sort that was very much connected with this previous uh, level of education. But we've s I made videos about Sidonius Apollinaris. We have looked at how, uh, really between the 5th the, the 6th century, with which figures of the caliber, I don't know, Gregory of Tours, uh, or like these are the big names of early medieval uh, European civilization. All concentrated here. Now we can't digress for each of them, but you understand the, the, the context. Right, so this in France you would see, let's say, modern thing today. What what is today's France at the time? This spread because of this re reshaping, mostly of monastic libraries, together with the monastic communities, and this need of, in part, um, separating yourself from the world for reflection, for study, for this kind of interior cultivation, and coming to the world being again you know, being a model for others and so on. And especially um, these libraries present in the bishops' households, right? The Gallo-Roman bishops were pretty much, especially when the Franks arrived and they, the, their families began to marry into each other as to, to form them. also much of the, the nobility of France in later times. Um, 
would have this this double face, right? From one side, especially in the south, again, a kind of a literate, civile, secular, urban figure that, however, was sort of a lord in the city who rode horses, who bore arms, right? That had, of course, um, wives. Um, I mean, a wife at a time, at least, um, children. Right, so leaving not very differently from kind of the, the, the a Frankish count arrived really fresh from the Western German force, right? So in having a, a lifestyle that, in fact, through the splendid a geography, I made a video about that from the Revision, Carolingian times that we have this time, um, you know, uh, uh, expresses a bit the hybrid, the synthesis of these cultures. Right, it's very funny when people say, you know, the Christians arrived, they began to destroy books and to didn't produce anything, so we have to recur. I don't know to to the sagas to understand how it works. Have you ever, you know, do you even know what a geography is? Do you, do you have the palest city of the scale of literary production that occurred in early medieval Christian Europe, and what what is actually contained in it? Right, just saying. Right, um, not that you know, I I love sagas as far as I'm concerned, but you know, you can't just uh, become blind um, and pretending to, you know, to spot uh, colors if you if you don't really see them, right? And that's that's the actual point. Now, um, uh, Gaul had been particularly important also in the history of um, of Western Christendom in general. I mean, um, there had been great figures connected to that, most famously. Think about Martin of Tours, that was essentially that would become the national saint. Uh, think about Sulpicius Severus as the biographer of Saint Martin. Um, but the general influence of figures like Jerome or Augustine, uh, think about um, Paulinus of Nola, who's actually from Bordeaux, right? So, um, had, shows beautifully how particularly close, and this is really a thing, not just ecclesiastically, but in uh, in a cultural sense, really Gaul and Italy were and remained, right? This, as we will see, is a, will be a light motive also as far as the uh, building of the French libraries um, at this time, because you real, real, realize that in Carolingian times and kind of uh, later, you know, the time of, of the Angevin Empire or the time of Francis I, like the idea that Italy was essentially the source, the spring of classical uh, knowledge and civilization in, in Western Europe, and that fundamentally the the romanity of the empire and that, that kind of and traditional universal aim. Sp- Frank, from, from those very models had to be recovered, not just the base of humanism of the Renaissance, but it's something that deeply informed properly the, the French political mentality. Right, As you know, by uh, the dawn of the Italian wars, the French saw Italy just as a sort of extension of, of, of their own country. They just had to come to dominate, in that case mostly for dynastic reasons, but literally it was more in terms of cultural awareness and what, what France had needed to be, after all. Um, that's that's actually a you know direction that during the same Middle Ages, think about the Frankish conquest of the Longbert King, that that the, what we call now the French world would have would have taken for strategic reasons for competing with the Byzantine Empire at that point for having an influence on Rome, as it would be true also for the Angevin Papal Guelph Alliance later on. So um, something that deeply affected the same development of of, of France as a country. That was always aware aware of of its Roman legacy, um, and uh, that that recognized to all um, it, of course, so much, uh, and that um, will we will see now. But I was thinking of something meaningful, but now I forgot. Uh, uh, regarding the churches, yes, I mean the fact that um, way before Charlemagne, actually Rome and uh, the uh, Frankish monarchy were very, 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 very close, right? Not just the fact that Clovis converted um, from paganism straight to Catholicism, skipping the Aryan uh, the, the Aryan phase, um, but the fact that the coordination, right, of the efforts, for example, the evangelization of the Anglo-Saxons or also the, of Central Europe, etc., did pass through this axis that was fundamentally the Roman papacy 
that, as you know, grew practically immediately autonomous from the Byzantine Empire, from which it technically still was, um, and uh, Frankish power, a German, a Germanic power, de facto, aside from the ups and downs, again, the fragmentation of the Merovingians, the Carolingian coming back, the end of the Carolingians, whatever, but that, that cultural connection was always very, very strong. It, it, it dated even to times of... Um, even with the long verse, right? The, the the monastery of Mont Saint Michel, famously enough, is uh, twinned with, with with the one of uh, Saint Michael uh, in um, in uh, Saint Angel's Mountain on the Gargano Peninsula. It, it was a uh, already actually an Italic sanctuary back back in the day in pre-Roman times, but it was deeply connected with the cult of Saint Michael, and so. This bloody, fiery, um, inferic uh, figure that the of, of the Avenger really that the Franks and the Longobards were radically obsessed with, and that uh, was properly at the root of their their highest warlike um, and exclusive in that sense um, uh, ethnic identity. Uh, so uh, there is really much more than that. That connection would be actually reactivated, especially in Norman times. And libraries, uh, we know that mostly through it because uh, it, the 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 way the Norman script um, arrived, for example, in southern Italy, uh, it's all connected with the dominance of the time of the of the Gothic. It was also properly Norman in, in an English dimension. You, know, you think that the, the, actually the Gothic concept was formulated first in England, and then it was mostly France that had more resources and. Uh, uh, to to to, imbe- to 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 develop it to to a degree that would eventually invest the same you know Germany Italy and so on, um, but um, had much to do even with this um, with this Norman origin. So I'm digressing, but just to make you understand how deep these connections were, right? I never see around like in the internet in pop culture and TV whatever anything that makes people aware of this axis that uh, lasted um, forever in many ways at least as, as long as the modern age where, where Italy was uh, was uh, fundamentally integrated in the orbit of other powers including part least the French attempted it then there were other but it remained always as a as a presence right and French culture in general had been affecting, as we've seen, the, the post carolingian kingdoms, Germany, Italy, and so on, in ways that, uh, of course, for which we, we account French culture to, to be dominant, right? Um, so there are areas where we find first French literature, then local vernacular, right, in this context, developing as a literary language. So we'll talk about this at some other point, but this is the power also, not not just of a culture, but also of the the media that were used to spread it in the form of the manuscripts, of course. Um, so um, this monastic or clerical life, however, the fourth and fifth century was was quite fruitful for this kind of development because even before Carolingian times, France had been began to develop this various. Um, religious centers of, of great importance because fr- um, Gaul was a bit of a frontier area as far as, uh, again, it contained a bit of everything. It contained at, at the most in northeastern most of some even kind of Germ- if not Germanic, at least heavily Germ- German influenced areas uh, with a few cities and that um, even, you know, at the same Frankish court, you know, Germanic was spoken until the, the 10th century. And then you have this Mediterranean coastline that is deeply Romanized, urbanized, literate, um, and in contact with places like Tuscany and beyond. So, um, y- the, for not talking about Spain, I mean, you know, the idea that that in spite of the the, vic- the Frankish victory at uh, Vouillet, the a Visigothic identity fundamentally remained south of the Loire, right, even after the fall of the kingdom uh, by the hands of, of the Arabs that swarmed around southern Gaul for a while, um, lived in the, you know, in such powerful legacies like, I don't know, the one of Sylvester II, Jabart of Aurillac, that gave properly, again, the, um, so the, the basis properly of the foundation of an imperial um, 
uh, universal dimension of the Roman Papas in the 11th century, in a moment in which these all these foreign, that's a good example of the aforementioned axis, right? Um, but but there was there was really a, a, a crossroad of, of experiences, right? Uh, southwestern Gaul, especially, is quite influenced by Spain. You can breathe it in the air if you visit it. You know, beautiful places, also as far as medieval history is concerned. Think about Carcassonne, um, Narbonne, Montpellier. The, the, there is really a lot in southern France. To lose, um, but really, you breathe that air of uh, of the uh, of one thousand of a night by a degree of something that um, emanates from Spain, and this kind of mystical knowledge, the fact that the Westerners objectively went from post Carolingian Europe to pick manuscripts in the first Islamic, then Christian library of Toledo, and then you know spreading science, astronomy, math, all this kind of stuff. Um, exactly this kind of uh, pretty early in time, telling the truth, mostly what we see as the revival, intellectual revival of the West. It's a moment in which the West had already reached by the 12th century at, at the latest, basically both the, the Arabs and the Byzantines, and it was just actually drawing from outside even more because they already knew what to find outside. So Gaul is a crossroad for this. Right, there are big topics such as you know the the the, uh, the Islamic filtered Aristotle as it was received at the University of of Paris that that, that triggered literally scholastics right so the the Christian integration of an Aristotelian system next to the Neoplatonic one that had dominated and that in France had had some of the deepest influence even in the development of the same gothic principles and so on so all true knowledge that passed through such libraries and through such um, students and and masters and uh, uh, and political minds because the rulers knew were, were very aware of these phenomena right um, so in spite of the fact that of course um, the most of the knowledge that was collected by the monks by the bishops in late antiquity was tendentially shorn of reference to Hellenic and Roman, um, say, religious uh, rites, mostly, not the actual concepts, which are literally the same. And I'm not going to digress, because I really talk only about this stuff nowadays, so you already know, but you can always check my... Um, my previous videos, especially the ones about Indo-European religion and medieval Christianity, so that you get an idea of that. Uh, the, the most important thing is that, in spite of what we perceive, in fact, as the collapse of late antiquity or whatever, there was a, a, a self-evident continuation of a learned book culture. And definitely southern France was mostly about, the southern goal was mostly the, the literally the beacon of light in Western Europe at this point for it, uh, in part because it remained relatively unshattered by invasions, right, even th there wasn't even properly a an erasing of the local, of different uh, uh, identity groups such as, uh, as we were saying before, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, right, there's a sense of, especially this had been the, the most strongly Romanized Germanic people, so they basically continued to rule just in, in the Roman way, so there was less break Right, comparing it to a more brutal warlike North, right? The Franks of the North are really something more, uh, more violent, more primitive. But um, even there, um, monasticism, uh, the the centrality of the Gallo-Roman uh, Gallo cities are, are, is always there, right? You can have an itinerant court, but at the end of the day, kings really stop also by the cities. The cities remain alive, doesn't matter how much they shrank. Right, and so Gaul never loses this. Also, because Gaul is very well structured, urbanly, infrastructurally, because again, the, the cities are very well uh, distributed, connected. There isn't basically any major, aside from the south, the Massif Central, etc., the Alps. Um, there, there is a, as far as the Atlantic plains are uh, concerned, like it, it's a very open ground. Right? Yes, yeah, so at this time there are forests. It's no kind of just simple plain or you know or how you would see the French countryside after in fact millennia 
of of uh, of cultivation, but it, it's at least you know a huge pool that is e easily controllable as far as at least the, the central power is uh, is intact, solid. Uh, so that lots of people, lots of agricultural resources can be uh, collected, and in fact, also by these centers that would remain always meaningful as episcopates, um, as generally speaking, pools of culture where this knowledge, this this books, the manuscript would be uh, preserved um, right by the uh, by the elite. This is quite, quite, quite important because it's literally the Gallo-Roman Frankish reality at, it, at its um, best, right? It's not, again, a, a particularly... Um, exactly because the elite is very elite, there's not such um, a widespread literacy, right? We're talking about early medieval times. It wasn't basically in any country, but let's say that the South that would remain more autonomous, it would be more literate, right? It had a different wealth distribution. Other countries were also more literate. Um, then gold man does maintain a bit of roughness on its own, but it's also a synthesis between two models, and also likely great part of the reason why this country turned out so successful as, as it would. Now, the development of libraries, we've seen it just the other day in the video again about the Carolingian manuscripts, requires a lot of resources. Right, materially speaking, only you know you have need this supply of prepared animal skins for parchment. It costs a freaking lot. It's it's a kind of a uh, a genocide of, of lambs of of of, of goats. It's terrifying. Right, then you have the ink, um, pens, other writing tools. Then you have binding supplies, so that this elite, by controlling such large amount of resources as we've seen, can organize them in a more functional way, but a degree in these times, making a lot survive. Then, then you you need the skilled scribes, the artisans to use um, uh, these resources. So you need uh, also a minimal surplus in in society for just f having these people in the first place. They would mostly gravitate around the lord's um, household, whether we're talking about a Frankish count. Or a Gallo-Roman uh, bishop that could be basically part of the same family, so the same, more or less, the same people. Um, so the the ability naturally to bring these resources and skills together at one place, right? So setting up a, a laboratorium, a scriptorium specifically, um, together with the opportunity to obtain exemplars from which to copy the texts, because this civilization was naturally relying on the classical one, right? It was no way around that, that world of literacy, of um, historiography, of political awareness, imperial political awareness, again, never died, was the only thing that had ever existed, right? Their understanding of history was also, by some degrees, historiographically, at least flat, flat enough compared to our own, to, for them to, to, to think it was normal, after all, there had been a Constantine that was both Roman and Christian as an emperor, and that was the model for any ruler, and basically everybody was living in the wake of that character, right? More or less, these things, naturally, there was a more refined historical awareness in, in these centers of culture. So, um, it, it was important to preserve knowledge, right? Um, so, when we look um, definitely at properly the north of Europe, the far north of Europe, who realized that Christianity came along with essentially a foreign language and a foreign religion. Goal was definitely not this, right? The Romans had even managed to Romanize the, the local language that was prevalent even, uh, let's say, was, was the, uh, the, the, the one of, of the north as well by this time. It, it so one of the uh, state goal was one of the uh, hosted one of the first uh, Christian communities since the beginning. So this was a mm, definitely a, a country that had already and unwaveringly uh, become Catholic, both in the Roman and Christian meaning of the concept. And where the injection of uh, Germanic peoples, as, uh, the, the, the dominating ones in, in the west of the Franks, of course, having Christianized immediately and uh, having basically formed this dynastic alliance with the Gallo-Roman elite, 
provided France with most of the solidity that other countries, especially the, the Gothic, the, the Gothic ruled ones, wouldn't have, because there was always kind of a fracture, at least internally, to their politics between kind of the continuity of the Arianism and kind of some specific uh, relation, not much just against the, the Byzantines, but also against the Franks, which is often I made videos about this specifically. So something that um, didn't um, facilitate the, um, especially from a, again, the, the fact of a religious policy, the solidity of the regime. This is true also for the Vandals. They were wiped out, you know, very easily by Belisarius. Instead, the Franks um, really managed to strip the gods um, from the, you know, the, the, the palm of, really, uh, of European hegemon. Right. And this was very important because there were lots of people in the east of the Franks um, that had, had uh, albeit still pagan, had supported with the Aryan gods um, to to escape the Merovingian pressure cause. And so also the fact that the, the, the Frankish world is not quite France. In fact, as we understand, it's, it's much more shifted towards the north and the east in a sense, um, there's no doubt that the cradle, let's say the, the properly the center power was in Romanized Gaul and it would be there in Merovingian as in Carolingian times. But the the idea too that there was a continuous struggle in a practically non existing eastern frontier. I mean the fact that the, this frontier was, was boundless by a degree and that was still an attention towards the, the Germanic pagan world in a mostly in a you know, in a pretty heavy, kind of harsh, authorita authoritarian, kind of dispositive um, fashion that helped definitely the Franks developing further their their imperial and Roman vocation. Um, surely made of gold, uh, even a fur, um, actually pro probably a, a more stable system, right, than if, say, I don't know, the Alamanni had won a Tulbiak, and so the, the, the Franks would have been resized, and nobody would have, you would have had a sort of mass in goal with, you know, the, the Alamanni, the Franks, the Burgundians, the, the Goths, and not quite a center. At least uh, Clovis really affirmed, again, a system that was not to be changed, arguably, until today, right? Because uh, whether uh, people like it or not, uh, the continuity between the, the Frankish rule and modern, uh, contemporary France is, is is there, right? Lots of things change, a lot of um, mechanisms changed, uh, culture did change, but the the political identity there and probably the, the imperial grandeur remained there in, in a, also in a startle, the, towards a startle direction, which was the one that fundamentally Clovis was supported by in fact, in, in a Gallo-Roman fashion since the beginning. Um, so in this local organization of libraries, uh, the clergy of the bishop's church and the monks uh, in the new abbeys were in need of books for liturgical service, collections of sermons, writing of the authorities of the earlier centuries, such as the aforementioned Augustine or Jerome, Commentaries on the scripture, and um, this um, this uh, work was extremely supportive of the imperial, in fact, um, hierarchical ideology of the accomplishment of the Merovingian dynasty. It's um, fundamentally the fact that it had collected any possible Roman legacy to to boast its its power. Uh, even by delegation from Constantinople as vicars of, of gold that Clovis had received probably a mantle, a scepter um, from the East. And, and all this was um, naturally coming along with the entire sense of the, the urge to, to classicize the uh, the cultural legacy of uh, of the same Merovingians and, and their blood. Right. So young boys were trained for monastic or clerical service needed um, uh, needing instruction in grammar, rhetoric, music, right? Um, we've seen the, the beautiful chants, processions that, that the Merovingians 
um, affirmed right uh, in their hematophilia, also stressing the uh, Christ's passion in the video about um, uh, a cr cross rising in blood, right? The sacralization of the ancient monarch and king. Um, and the, um, also other liberal arts, of course. So classical poets were copied and imitated. The art of letter writing flourished in Go for early medieval standards. Again, it's a big deal, right? Um, some clue to the nature of these early medieval libraries uh, at the monastery or cathedral can be gleaned by the work of uh, the author who was resident there, but citation from a copy of the full work itself rather than a flurry legend, that is to say, um, a collection of extracts of different uh, excerpts, let's say, is not always demonstrable uh, at this point. Um, Gaul is, again, um, only relatively compact from a cultural point of view. It was just stated before the Carolingian reform, we will see now. Um, even the script was not really standardized. It was kind of a more similar script to the Visigothic one in the south. There were different influences from various areas. Just the, also the literacy, uh, literacy standards of the same clergy weren't particularly high because of the aforementioned barbarization. We know in some places like Bavaria, again, it's not France, and, it, and it's in the easternmost frontier, but we know that, you know, as Christians as they were, they couldn't even read Latin, so they basically misread the Bible in ways that the, the Carolingians found horrid enough to, to, to fix the wall system, um, which naturally was carried out together with the Roman imperial uh, crowning, the papal connection, again, the reactivation of that axis, that with the reactivation, basically, the of a Western Empire was obvious and necessary, right? The Merovingians tried that, but the Longobards had gone in the way, then the big crisis of the late 6th, early 7th century kicked in, the Merovingians fragmented into four distinct kingdoms in the north, always quarreling with each other. So this in part actually favored the mm, prosperity of some episcopal and monastic centers and the um, salvaging of some uh, libraries, right? Because otherwise, the tendency would have been to immediately centralize. At least that's what Clovis, the, the early Merovingians, tried to do with the means they had. But poorly, not even the Carolingians could achieve that fully. But the latter, at least, triggered like um, properly a, a, an ecclesiastical reform in a monastic phenomenon of unprecedented scale. That is fundamentally the same one for which we use uh, the the Carolingian script still nowadays, and why it, that fundamentally homogenized heavily the way of um, properly writing manuscripts um, and uh, properly even storing and having this common sense that there was a general broader Western Christian uh, um, uh, systematization of knowledge that lives on throughout the Middle Ages to eventually take over the entire Europe and, and the world from there. Um, in the uh, you know in the following centuries, um, in the following millennium. So this um, say with the rise of the Carolingian monarchy, and especially under the the enlightened reign rule of of, of Charlemagne and Louis the Pious, uh, a great new impetus was given to learning, literary culture, manuscripts, and libraries. The idea, again, is that the, the Franks saw the world a bit through the, the filter of a, a hybrid filter, both a bit of Germans and, and Romans at the same time. They, they, they basically uh, drew the, the sense of magic of the script from, from the former, still this kind of very unsecular and unmodern world, and then they, they got the solemnity of classical civilization, of the of imperial culture, and so what fundamentally they had to pursue as ecumenic rulers of a renewed Roman Empire. Um, again, this plan was crucial as far as uh, Western civilization and world civilization is concerned. Charlemagne brought um, uh, literally the European intelligentsia, of the, the Western European intelligentsia of the, of the time, uh, to his court. Right, there are great names from all, basically all the countries, and the most important one, meaningfully enough, was even outside the Carolingian Empire. We're talking about Alcuin, uh, this 
what is believed to be the, the most learned man of his time, like in, uh, the, this literary theological scholar from from uh, from Anglo-Saxon England, that also had been quite close to the the Frankish world since ever at least some, especially part of the southeast had been de facto of the Anglo-Saxon southeast were de facto Frankish clients at some point, and there was an intense relation between them. Um, and Alcuin would become, famously enough, head of the palace school of Charlemagne. Charlemagne and his successors patronized monasteries and their libraries. This was a way to essentially create um, a state that wouldn't fragment privatistically, like generation after generation from the split of the inheritance. So if it was a bishop, uh, an abbot, you could simply remove them, and at their death, uh, somebody else would have been put in their stead. Of course, a great deal of privatization also in this environment, because you know, abbots and bishops were from the same aristocratic families. But indeed, the ecclesiastical immunities um, in the institutions in general were something different now, especially with the renewed, the reaffirmed alliance with Rome. And as we've seen, up to essentially one-third of the land at this point was practically possessed by the church which is an, 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 an unspeakable lot. And soon these um, centers with their libraries would become the um, connective fabric of post carolingian Europe in quite a tumultuous time of essentially evaporation of at least of an effective imperial rule. Um, uh, and in a moment of great political reorganization, first fragmentation, then building from, from the bottom up uh, again. Um, as far as Carolingian times properly are concerned, um, that left the mark from, from, from the rest, founding lots of these new centers, and so some already existed, as you understand, but they were boosted forward. Um, the library at the Abbey of Saint Denis, uh, that is basically um, France, is exclusively and only Saint Denis, and there is nothing outside um, Saint Denis, as far as France is concerned. France is exclusively Sandini. Nothing exists about France outside of Sandini, right? Um, this is the abbey that every um, French king uh, was vassal to historically, and this this expresses the highest um, spiritual and devo divine devotion in the uh, in the mystic of the French mark, right? And if you haven't visited Saint-Denis, first of all, shave your head, uh, walk on some burning charcoal, and then go in pilgrimage to it, because otherwise it will come there with a gun and oblige you to, to do that. Now, um, um, the, the, the this library, of course, it was the, the heart of it all, right? They had to contain the, the ideology of the thing. It had donations from uh, Charles the Bald, perhaps from Charlemagne himself, it's quite likely. And it, it it's very important for another reason, uh, philologically speaking, because it um, uh, contained an Hellenic manuscript, uh, which was a quite rare thing at the time, because basically in Western Europe you didn't have almost anyone being able to translate or teach Greek, right? Uh, and especially uh, uh, the Hellenic manuscript of the works of the Pseudo Dionysus, uh, the Aeropagite, Ar right? That was essentially a made up character. It was a spurious source, but that influenced dramatically um, the entire Catholic um, ideology as far as properly even the construction of cathedrals that together with Augustine's De Musica were basically conceived as just pure pure spirit, pure light. Pure, it, it, it inspired itself with all these um, theological principles, not a uh, material one, architectonical one, like, I don't know, Vitruvius or something. First of all, it, it was a highly spiritual, traditional, universal meaning behind the entire architecture of imperial France, uh, from largely also the works contained in the library of Saint-Denis. Um, it was Louis de Pius that uh, gifted the library of Saint-Denis with this work, which is the uh, one of the Bibliothèque uh, Nationale uh, 
GREC uh, 437, if I'm not wrong, was received by the Carolingian Emperor by the Byzantine Emperor at the time. It was, again, a huge deal because this was one of the closest moments to the attempted, at least, reunification of East and West, right, as far as to make, to, to restore, the, also dynastically, um, and administratively, the, the unity of the empire. Uh, we all well know, as you we were saying before, how Charlemagne favored uh, the standardization of, the, of, say, the script in general. This mostly, uh, of course, uh, related to the uh, to the text of, of the scripture, the liturgy, canon law, right? Uh, this texts had to be proper because they were literally the ones that would help the empire uh, taking over the world once again. Uh, and in order to do that, um, the emperor took great care of having an uh, exemplar from Italy brought to Gaul. Right, this was crucial again. They were trying to imitate the same script. The same Carolingian script is essentially an imitation of what at least the Carolingians uh, thought that the uh, the ancient m m m Roman manuscript text really was. It was actually late antique Unchal. Um, but everything concerning the uh, Roman antiquities uh, that naturally were present there, it's just that in form of culture and, you know, um, just tradition, education, etc. in Rome were imported dramatically, not just from Rome, also from places like Ravenna, Milan, that had been the, especially the most important, in fact, ecclesiastical centers, the ones very close would go, especially Milan, and that were now being um, essentially controlled by the Franks that had conquered um, the, the long bird lands where, where these uh, archdiocese uh, existed. And so uh, the first duty of any Roman emperor is ruling over Rome, and hopefully from Rome. Um, and, and, um, and like in other times in history, like the, the, the Italian um, works of art, etc., were fundamentally brought somewhere else as a sort of prey uh, of war, but naturally also in the respect of these communities, and as you know, Charlemagne was actually quite respectful of the the integrity of the Italic uh, kingdom as such, so much that it was the only land that maintained its crown, right, that Charlemagne seized for, for himself instead of basically degrading the other peoples who were conquered. Because, uh, again, it was crucial to get the, the spiritual force from the very land from which the empire had been born, that thus by uniting with the, the Frankish war likeness would have been unstoppable. Um, unfortunately, naturally, you know, what was brought from Italy was copied, then redistributed, literally it was a very advanced kind of um, uh, redistribution system, kind of connected. There is, you know, the the same one you can admire in the, the logistic of, uh, of Carolingian armies, right? So, Again, the aforementioned, well, intelligent distribution of the various uh, monasteries and other centers, mostly centered in Gaul, but again, now all around, or connecting post carolingian Europe, so mostly today's France, Benelux, um, West Germany, and, uh, and, and uh, central northern Italy, were now part of this big community of knowledge sharing, of uniform standardized kind of um, uh, textual culture that was meant to hold the empire together. Naturally, the thing wouldn't happen, but because the Carolingian Empire disintegrated, but um, this very system survived, which was arguably the greatest of all the Carolingian legacies, surely the most successful, aside from the fact that, again, the the imperial title still remained, but it had never died out in their mentality. So, as you know, peoples like the Vikings um, took a liking in second manuscripts, uh, and at some point, uh, in, in spite of the, the the fact of say the stereotype that they were uh, bloodthirsty brutes, they they would also at least understand the 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 worth of the manuscripts. Right? We don't get much of this information, but I wouldn't be surprised if even sacking these um, this books um, 
you know, Christianity spread further in the northern world, fundamentally had always known uh, that this religion was essentially remembered as, as the part of the bigger empire, so the universal power that the elites treasured themselves um, in their um, in their world and um, didn't you know, I kind of uh, classically destroyed just because they were Christian. They weren't really seeing seeing it uh, like that. It's just it took a while before the thing fully happened. In any case, um, uh, even the second invasions that eventually lead, uh, let's say, led nowhere in terms of major territorial political um, acquisitions within the, the, the the boundaries of what had been the Carolingian Empire wouldn't stop, in fact, um, the revival of studies um, and of libraries themselves, the, their further structuring, um, especially from the second half of the 10th century and obviously uh, with an explosion from the 11th and the following centuries. All these centers became ever more important. Right, um, there is a bit more of difficulty in the in the immediate uh, aftermath of the Carolingian Empire fall, so that um, the the relative rarity of book lists, especially from the period, makes reconstruction of holdings difficult. This was not even necessarily caused by the um, by the invasion. It was just an early time, and certain systems of um, say catalogs, etc., had yet to be. Developed also because there were very few manuscripts, right? At least, you know, uh, a library of 70 manuscripts was considered probably the largest uh, in Europe at, at the time, right? In a single place, so because manuscripts cost a lot, but for this reason, they were treasured, and you always see that the continuity in their copying and their organization uh, of the libraries because that's the importance that they gave to knowledge at the time for their own political uh, and spiritual and cultural goals, right? That were surely the one of a prosperous civilization now booming again in the high Middle Ages. Um, and there is actually evidence suggesting that, for example, the abbeys of Cluny and Saint-Benoît-sur-Loire, among others, by the way, had uh, extensive libraries and that they carefully regulated the lending of their books outside the local community. Here you understand we're talking about Burgundy, the, the Loire, so we're the very heart of today's France. Um, very rich, fertile uh, areas, right? Uh, in, uh, in, in in places that, after all, uh, could suffer a raid or two, but could come back on their feet uh, at a point. The letters of Peter the Venerable make it clear that Cluny, uh, lent books and requested loans from from others, right? So there was actually a great circulation of manuscripts for the time being. Monks traveled just uh, to copy manuscripts. For example, we have um, a trans-channel uh, instance uh, in the late 12th century when the abbot of Saint Alban in England wrote to the abbot of Saint Victor at Paris to ask if a monk could be sent to Saint Victor specifically to copy some of the works of uh, Hugo of Saint Victor that were not in the English Abbey's collection. So you understand that it's not just a matter of book circulation of an accidental exchange. It was literally a you know a program planned and, and systematic process of sharing of copying of uh, intellectual theological spiritual interest, cultural interest, that would make the centers uh, expanding. Because, by the way, they were also, you know, all these monasteries and, and, and abbeys were, were landowners. They, they had lots of people working for them. They had connections with, with the kings, uh, with the emperors. They had, as you understand here, probably an international profile, right? So this is evident with the growth of cathedral schools in the 11th and the 12th century. Right, because these were also properly urban centers, urban libraries that began to develop um, the institutions as well, and within the institutions themselves as well. Right, so what would happen is that bishops, that by the way were very powerful, right in France and especially at this time, they had uh, they had been with the collapse of the Carolingian monarchy at some point 
properly the ones that had defended the cities, had ruled them, right? they acquired uh, great power as lords. We, we saw it in videos about medieval France and how properly the, the, the high clergy worked, like at the level of properly the high nobility with some prerogatives that were lordly in all, uh, for all really, and with military retinues, etc. Um, and these men of the world were also quite, um, quite learned in their own way, right? The clergy, naturally, mostly, more, more than, than everyone. Um, scholars and masters bequeathed their personal libraries. Patrons donated manuscripts or funds for copying, right? If, you know, this was not normally done as a form of, uh, you know, mostly of investment, right? Just like you would give some land to a monastery because you you know that, you know, to, a, to an abbey, uh, I don't know, because you're, your daughter was an abbess. You know, the place there was the, the the family abbey with all the immunities. You among various things, what you want to give them: land, cattle, manuscripts, because they, it's as valuable uh, as they are, and you may have also a legitimate interest in boosting further. There was a lot of competition regarding this um, manuscript production. Um, the um, Archbishop of Rennes, Gerbert of Aurillac, the aforementioned Pope Sylvester uh, II, from his uh, enormous culture at the time, asked a friend of his to copy Caesar's Commentari de Bello Gallico for him, and he sought other classical manuscripts at Rome herself. Right. This guy was, again, he had made all the courses on arm, he had become Archbishop of Ram, he had be, uh, and again, would become Pope. Uh, he said that Ravenna, he had uh, a monastic experience. So, we're talking about people who traveled, who made Europe in its imperial universal identity. Right? Uh, again, Jacques Martovoriac made video about him explaining specifically this point. It was, was the one that basically, at the crisis of the Ottonian Empire, shifted this um, uh, Catholic, um, you know, uh, imperium to Rome, right, to what, what, where in a, in a few um, generations, in fact, the papal monarchy would have been established as a peer to the, uh, to imperial powers as a, as a universal authority. So, again, the fact you would need this work, they wanted these copies, they wanted to collect, because they knew they existed in the first place, right, so, but they wanted ever more precise versions, etc. Enlarged properly the need, uh, the, 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 um, the demand, the cost, the, 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 the value, right, of books, for which also libraries had to be built accordingly, right, certain criteria. Um, the library of the Cathedral of Chartres was the beneficiary of many bequests of books. Around the mid-12th century, Thierry of Chartres, these were all involved in cathedral building, and, you know, building this, this 80 monsters across Europe with something enormous with the ancient resources exactly concentrated in these generations. Right, this, this very bishop, left 50 volumes from his private library. Private library. So we're not even properly talking about the cathedral one. Right? We're talking about his own, as a, as a private person. Um, and John of Salisbury, who died as Bishop of Chartres in 1180, left his books to the cathedral as well. This was yet another... Uh, frequent practice, right? To leave that as a as a donation again for your soul, as a testament for, say, would would you leave your your goods to? It may seem like a dark idea, uh, especially for a young person. But you you may want to think about that because um, you know life takes the turns it does, and you may want to provide properly with the meaning, uh, the, your entire experience and knowledge there, wisdom. Truth uh, seems to be some of the most important values that you want to leave out there, that you want others to to know, to learn. Of. And this is this is really, especially from an author like John of Salisbury, like a you know big deal. Uh, the Abbey of Saint Victor that we mentioned before um, was definitely one of the leading schools of um, Paris. 
in the 12th century, right? Um, Paris was growing definitely as a that was a proper capital, right? Um, after you know, still the court was itinerant in many ways, but Paris was now stabilizing as the fixed center of the Capetian monarchy. Um, and as a consequence, these centers just for the near instability of the place, right? More resources would be invested in the city, more stuff stored. Well, the Abbey of Saint Victor quickly am- amassed a significant library uh, through donations uh, and copying. Uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame received the library of Peter Lombard, including his set of volumes of, of the Glossed Bible, the Glossa Ordinaria, and Gratian's volume on canon law. These were some of the most updated works of, of the time, as far as biblical exegesis and um, you know, properly canon law. The, 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 the Decretal Collection also made a video about the work some time ago uh, is concerned. Um, so, again, think about even the, the naturally there were other copies circulating, but also having a certain quality of the manuscript, a certain property of the copy, right? The, the, the finest, uh, the most expensive books were definitely the, the best collectors of such knowledge and were recognized as such. Consider that we're in the 12th century. There isn't yet a fully, properly kind of, a, of monetary economy going on. People still did barter a lot, still believed in this very material, uh, concrete culture, right? That, you know, for which, I don't know, a, um, a king's uh, gift would be um, um, like, a, for example, some juicy uh, pike fish, uh, from fish from from the neighboring, uh, from 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 the nearby lake, right? This this kind of world that cared about the physicality, the materiality, and again, the manuscripts were were this. It it they they cost tens of of animals butchered that were that cost really a lot, uh, also on the market at the time. For not talking about the work of refining everything, so. Um, in order to have these books and having them copied in the time, and the day, it, it it really immediately manifested how powerful, rich, and also knowledgeable and cultured, and you really were, right? Also politically, socially. Um, with the growth of the universities and their colleges, just again. Uh, coincidence, but in the last days we talked about medieval universities, their organization, etc. New libraries for masters and scholars came into being. Uh, this process, as we've seen, was delicate because not just uh, you know these teachers had to do their job and the students uh, paid uh, really a lot to receive these lessons for years. But because new ideas were literally made at the time, this could be quite controversial, especially from a theological point of view and uh, the study of, of, of Paris. The library of the Sorbonne uh, originated as the library of a house for poor scholars, right? Because it was literally fi- founded by a guy known as Sorbonne, right? That's the name, Roberta Sorbonne. Um, and, um, and, and this set uh, had set the a bit the standards of also the as as a foundation, right? The, the this example of donating books just for even for the poor, right? The idea that you know that are foundations to maintain certain people that could not afford just to pay for the studies, especially in the ecclesiastical world was um was there, right? Um also because uh normally those people were within the car- the ecclesiastical career since uh, an early age, and so the, especially the most talented were selected intellectually for um, for becoming, hopefully, scholars in this great theological center. Um, so much so that the Sorbonne, by the 13th century, had over 1,000 volumes in her library. That Again, it's the 13th century, it's not the line of the 12th, but it's still really a freaking lot. Right, and if you look at what is happening with the Carolingian script at this point, is that it was turning in what at the time was known as Littera Moderna, and that uh, today we call simply the Gothic script. That is a bit like the cathedrals, right? It's all tall and very thin, 
modestly tall actually and thin to, to save space because the idea is that they wrote so much that they, they, so much knowledge was contained now this is the century of scholastic but there is a really a massive uh, theological scientific boom right in terms of written stuff um, also papers scan around by, by this point so the idea is that you have to produce ever more and the script had to be properly standardized in a way that would allow to 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 put as much as possible into the the the, uh, the manuscript itself and everything was properly categorized stored etc in a very very advanced fast way because there were so many of these volumes also the catalogs improved the accessibility improved at least for those who were um working with this volumes etc so it, it's really a frenetic growth Right, and there has been a recent detailed analysis of the catalogs of the Sorbonne collection that gives properly the sense of such development and innovation. For example, the library was subdivided um, around we're in, in the last decade of the 13th century into a large library of chained books, right, made up of those manuscripts most frequently needed by masters and scholars for reference. And then a smaller library that could that instead continue to lend books to individuals. Um, that's how important still in a you know properly rich the apex of the great medieval civilization century like like the thirteenth, how precious books were. So much so probably the one of the Sorbonne mostly and those books that were of vital importance of great fame and, and had to be properly certain uh, certified in the content, etc., were famously like a see also in other late medieval libraries that still exist today properly chained their books to the uh, to the banks so where were, where you, you go there studying because you couldn't of course take them away because they were so precious that it was uh, they weren't just manuscripts like all the others and then a, a small little library when you said you had kind of b rate manuscripts you could also hand more um, more frequently ruin a bit of bind, you know, if you have handled a, uh, a parchment manuscript, you know how resi resistant they they really are over time. They're very, very, very strong. Uh, differently from paper, it naturally was cheaper and was booming at the time, but that mostly um, corrodes. Right? It's also good um, in that sense, but surely not as much as parchment. Then there is some parchment that sucks too, but you know that that's in fact. That tells you also about the various levels of wealth that existed and that were involved in this. Um, in 1321, the Sorbonne regulations required that the best copies of each work owned by the college be kept in the chained library. And the college also required an adequate pledge be deposited when a book was borrowed. Right, so a bit like in modern libraries where there was an ever increased check and not just random people passing by and not knowing what it is. This is really crucial, because really in history there hadn't been anything like this, right? Uh, the great Hellenistic libraries, like the one of Alexandria, etc., weren't actually that big deal in terms of accessibility. There were only a very few um, court scholars would go there. They would consult just a minimal part of that, they mostly wrote... Even what we call science was just 90% like philology, myths, literature of some sort. Paradoxically, the Roman libraries were much more lively in terms of properly accessibility. People went in Rome went to the library uh, for collective uh, hearings, reading this manuscript. So um, the manuscript, the, the, the West, uh, in, even in, in its roughness, was actually more sensitive to, to knowledge and to its accessibility in ancient times compared to, to the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and it's only in the Middle Ages that you really have this inexhaustible thirst of knowledge that would never be achieved by any other time in history, not even the Enlightenment. It was mostly fixated on the categorization of information, rather. Um, and that... Um, really is reflected in these kind of uh, provisions because it tells you how many people went properly working on these manuscripts and how important it has remained really up to up to this day. I'm not, uh, as a medievalist, a very, you know, archive-going uh, person because I hate, I detest that and I can fortunately work on other sources. 
um, but it, it's also a beautiful experience, and it it it, it's, uh, it makes you humble. It makes you really live through, in part, the same ex sensorial experience like a, a medieval scholar would, because reading these manuscripts is really, you know, they're very logically built. They're very logically written, organized, thought out, and um, you can't you. It really makes you understand how sensitive the medieval man was to knowledge, to a way that, in comparison today, you know nobody really can even fathom, really, um, the way contemporary people think, even think to know is is utterly disgusting to even conceive, right? And, uh, learn from medieval people that were by far more intelligent and more capable than you can ever dream to to imagine, even to to think to become. In any case. Um, uh, aside from the great theological studies and the other universities, etc., there, there was a private world. Um, of course, we will look at this in, in detail in so many other videos, hopefully, because it's really a big topic. But um, the most important example we can make for a country like France is definitely the one of the royal um, libraries, right? Uh, patronage by kings, but also nobles, right? Great, the great uh, nobility. Of France had uh, always played an important role in the development of the same aforementioned development of monastic and cathedral libraries, right? They had always operated in tandem. Um, some of the most beautiful manuscripts, let's say, of in fact, post carolingian world, say between the 10th and the and the 12th centuries, are just splendid nobiliar donations there to, to manuscripts. Um, when really in a time in which the, the manuscript was not again so common and there weren't so many so they were really pieces of you know of great worth right it, it was really like having a having a lamborghini or something right you know that's the the thing um because they cost really that much um as a consequence, that naturally those who donated in those years as noblemen were pretty much uh, ignorant people. They were mostly illiterate. They, they, you can say that they were ignorant about, um, you know, culture in general because there were so many oral traditions and songs and things. That, but of course, they weren't literate. They wouldn't study these works. They wouldn't. You know, they would live a completely different life. In the later Middle Ages, however, the, the refinement also of French um, courtly culture. I mean, think about the court of Burgundy, among, even if you don't want to mention the, the Valois um, proper. Um, let's say, um, were, were really, um, you know, into, into books, right? Book collection production, whatever, right? Just to make an example, a notable French royal and noble bibliophile um, list would include uh, John II, the good, the one captured at Battle of Poitiers, about which I made a video, 1356. Um, uh, just to tell you how it would be a person who would just take the field, also with great boldness and had a great sense of chivalry itself. So very often here we are in the 14th century. So there had been sometimes the same knights being great composers. Think about the Minnesänger, think about the same French chivalric courtly culture and literature and so on. They, they were in a sense uh, also in terms of lay topics, right? Um, they were great talents and artists and composers. Right, not necessarily writers, but say composers and some a bit of this bardic tradition, right, that you can't find even among the great literates of Roman Gaul, or before we were mentioning Gilberto uh, Vauillac from the, the talking about Caesar's De Bello Gallico. Well, what is that if not kind of a bardic production of his own deeds uh, and 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 military explorer, you know? Um, the same King Charles V. Then uh, uh, Jean Duc uh, de Berry, Philip the Bold, and Philip the Good, as far as the the Duchy of Burgundy is concerned. Uh, again, it was not even so normal at the time. Again, an average aristocrat at the time wasn't even so so particularly learned per se. But definitely, the late Middle Ages in France, that already at that point had affirmed itself as. Um, 
a cultural superpower in Europe um, would um, would um, develop a sense that like even the, the tendency towards uh, statehood and um, let's say uh, leadership kind of more centralized institutions as were required uh, educated rulers right somebody that would start taking a look at the theory too rather than just the practice we've seen this i think pretty well in our series about von clausewitz um how basically a true theory that was told to make a minimal impact on practice began only with the renaissance we're basically almost there um conceptually um but also in other videos about modern warfare and, and the development of modern theories think about machiavelli um uh, Montecuccoli before von Clausewitz naturally. Um, so the French here as great uh, rulers, like think about the Kingdom of France, the same Dutch of Burgundy, the, the Burgundian state, right? These were great powers, and as such, they needed to to aggrandize themselves so as far as to to a, to a royal standard that entailed a very high culture at the same time. The letters were crucial. Um, John the Second for example, purchased or commissioned manuscript books of religious and secular varieties. He commissioned a translation of the Bible into French. Um, not that there weren't already, uh, but that he wanted his Bible to be that Bible, right, and to be translated, right, proper, because also properly the knowledge of, uh, at that point, of Greek, of, of, of other... Um, of, of the more original language was beginning to just to come around, right? He also commissioned uh, a translation of Livy into French by Pierre uh, Bersuire. This uh, again shows the most of the humanistic, classicistic tendencies of the time. Um, uh, the late medieval philology now was starting properly to imitate Latin, classical Latin at the perfection in terms of translation or even just writing, original writing. So it was the time which this, um, even just the curiosity, wanted to, to read Livy and the wars, the deeds of the Romans in, in, a, you know, in, a, in, in a language also that would be more, more the, the vernacular fundamentally, but with, with a scientificity that this, this um, that, that it had never acquired up, up to that point, you know, as a for a literary dimension, was was important for the same people to read, to know, to to wanted to know something from this past, whether the way the Romans fought was could could be of help for Prince Charles V, the, the son of John II, took great interest in the royal library. Of France, and it had it installed in a tower of the Louvre. Um, this shows also the proximity of, of these monarchs to, to the need of having properly a, uh, a physical um, closeness with, with books themselves. Uh, Charles, uh, in fact, would even enlarge his collection further with through the usual purchase commission uh, and sometimes confiscating the library of defeated enemies which sounds pretty you know um, vengeful uh, as an achievement especially for someone that really treasures books so much is a big deal we all have this feeling I, I wish I had that book I'm searching that I really needed it by chance, let's say you you acquire it all of a sudden, you feel so uh, so satisfied, so proud of yourself. Um, so again, consider how in in a context like the Hundred Years' War, etc., even you know a book could be a prey of an important spoil of war. What do you fight for, right? Surviving records give um, details naturally of the purchases of materials. Too, for making the books, the binding costs, and the payments to the illuminators and booksellers. I mean, some were really works of art just for the illumination alone. Everything had normally to go in parallel with, with a certain, mm, say, uh, 
clarity of the text and important arrangement. There is all a science behind how you properly present a manuscript page right, uh, to, the, to the reader. And like uh, John II, Charles V had numerous Latin works translated into French for his library, including uh, classical literature, histories, philosophy, Right, so the interest among the sovereigns was really, uh, really remarkable. We mentioned John, Duke of Berry, the brother of Charles V, uh, who was also a bibliophile, was a family thing apparently, and as he accumulated um, one of the single most important private um, uh, libraries in, in the Middle Ages. John had an extensive collection of classical literature in Latin and in French translation, meaningfully enough. At this point, you don't find practically anything of Greek literature around, right? Just the Italians exactly at this point with Boccaccio, the same years of John and Charles V were starting to make public lessons in, in Greek because they had began to master it. Uh, through their philological acquisition uh, in the humanism. But the, the, this is also important. I mean, the fact that the Middle Ages, the Western Middle Ages, is essentially a Latin Middle Ages as far as, uh, say, high culture is concerned and also as far as literature is concerned, the old works. It's all something that influences or continues in the wake of a, um, say of a Latin mindset Right, that had been substantially different from the one of the Byzantines, even in fact through the medieval millennium. Um, the Duke of Berry also commissioned uh, numerous works, including some of the most splendid books of, of, of the Howards of later Middle Ages. Right, at least, at least it's my favorite in the art, all but, uh, and I inserted. Uh, them also in uh, among the pictures here uh, the, and the, there is all an ideal of, of the world I mean this essentially gothic um, uh, ethereal spiritual celestial order of uh, gentilesse of chivalry of courtly standards and ideal of a world properly dominated by the castle by the by the city over over nature over uh, the creation as such right and um, surrounded with, within the astronomic cycles etc so an idea of an order that had to be preserved in in that splendor in that grace in that uh, elegance right has to do with this kind of French style emerging from from the course definitely and consolidating towards a subtle direction um, John of, of Berry was also part of a large gift exchange network uh, among the members of aristocracy because they were in their uh, smaller scale but not so small sometimes doing exactly the same thing um, in fact they would um, present each other with sumptuous illuminated manuscripts right that was a hell of a gift a princely one and there was a lot of competition around, you know, the, the best uh, illuminations, best art, best manuscript, most precious one, the most expensive one, right? For which they could spend, in fact, considerable amounts of money. Again, Francis the First, we're talking about the modern age, we will not see that, but literally he had all this um, library modeled on the the Italian Renaissance style and so on with a with a with a French. Uh, Fleur de Lis, standardized cover, this kind of things, and he was literally told by his financial advisors that that cost too much for the French coffers, and that that gives you a dimension of how expensive such um, manuscripts really were, and how much people cared about that knowledge, or what they thought through this knowledge could be achieved. Especially, it wasn't just merely uh, intellectual or aesthetical caprice; it was literally thinking that through that knowledge you would have acquired essentially a greater sense uh, of the world of you know awareness of education you would have been smarter as a sort of shortcut it does reflect a bit the modernization and secularization of the world probably their ancestors of just a few centuries before would have not liked very much all this 
a literary interest for men that should have been just nice fighters. Um, but that, that's also the world that changes. You need ever bigger means. You need ever more uh, uh, um, a theoretical uh, mindset, a frame to 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 order um, an ever bigger, uh, an ever bigger, in fact, um, and costly system here. We're talking about the same reformers of the French army, as I explained in some of my videos about the French army organization, um, that, uh, you know, would ha they were coping with some of the most uh, critical uh, defeats, right, of the, of the French military in, in medieval times, and with the risk of this entire world, the entire monarchy uh, and the dynasty at the head of it, to collapse right, with with what all the Capetians had basically managed to amass with this enormous power. And yet these people, with all the, the mess that was going on, with all the problems they had, they wanted to have their own beautiful manuscripts. And reading them and being curious about the content and being ecstatical about the form and, and so on. Now, Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, began um, one of the great collections of, um, of let's say, the, of Northern Europe um, broadly meant. He purchased many devotional texts, histories, um, miscell uh, miscellaneous treatises from Parisian booksellers. So there was, as you understand, a long-range kind of uh, traffic around this, and mostly Again, it's it's uh, religion, it's history, right? It's this kind of mm, old, um, also creative way of uh, uh, citing different branches of knowledge, right? To have a kind of customized um, um, education, right? Because these books naturally would be also read in the court later on, it would become sort of treasures and so on. Philip's descendants in Burgundy continued to enlarge such collection, in fact, um, with, among other things, a copy of the works of uh, Christine de Pizan and translations of Boccaccio's The Cameron, which also shows uh, yet another connection with Italian culture. You know, that Christine de Pizan was essentially a, a Venetian noblewoman who married um, a French nobleman and who wrote um, really a lot about lots of things, things that also at the time women were not thought to be, you know, were not even supposed to be thinking about like politics, war, and so on. And she actually had a great success for the time. You have uh, Boccaccio's The Camera, and that naturally is a very um, varied kind of mosaic, you know, 14th century. Uh, Florentine culture, and even there, and that sense of patrician, um, in fact, also intellectual doubt. I mean, Florence just already the, the capital of humanism, uh, and that uh, was uh, reaching peaks that were close to royalty and princely standards, and so that also in the rest of Europe were quickly acquired. Um, interestingly enough, also because they were f translated from Italian vernacular into French. Right, this Boccaccio's works. I mean, I remember the Greek stuff, right? You know, only at this time. What was also well, it was the sense that uh, lots of interesting stuff were coming from there. Florence at this point was very close to France, um, still. So it makes sense in, in other ways. Now, the, the library of the Dukes of Burgundy reached its peak under Philip the Good, who also, again, enlarged uh, his ducal collection to inheritance, exchanges of gifts, commissions, purchases, the, the usual thing. Wait, what is interesting about his, um, about Philip's editions is that they range from classical literature, uh, over classical literature, vernacular translations, religious texts, and even books on the Near East, on the Levant, which sounds appropriate considering that the Duchy of Burgundy was claiming at the time the crown of Jerusalem. Right, the, the crown of, of the king of Jerusalem, the, the Burgundians were considered as the most splendid knights uh, in Europe, their court to be the finest, um, sh the, the most chivalric one in absolute terms. So, 
reflections we've seen also in other works at this point of the last phases of the hundred years war from veterans from noblemen who began to write themselves about their own military experiences and again this need of um putting to theory uh, what was at least sought by them in in for in, in practice Right, even about government, war, and so on, it seemed like the, the most important thing. There are these specular principles. We made a video just about the Scottish ones of the 15th century, in the same century, that can be useful and interesting because even there, there was the necessity of feeling that, as the Normans and thus also the English later, they claimed to to be descending from the Trojans, that the Scottish and the Stuarts instead had descended from from the the Achaeans. Um, that had defeated, of course, the Trojans. Um, so this kind of uh, also international representation that did pass through the libraries and their content and what could be also ideated by the, the courtly scholars that were working also on these works because that's what we're, that was the point also that we're talking about single rulers now just to make the video simple and how they gathered this this manuscript. This manuscript were accessed by the courtly scholars as well. They had to work on them to invent things, right? So it was a great privilege even just to work at the time and this is the time of, you know, special great elitism in literature. There are great scholars that just are so because they're paid, I mean because they're very talented of course, but because they have been fostered as such by the great um the great princes of the time paid them just for studying, which is a huge deal, like all the life that you would like to, to have yourself. Um, and um, and it did bring to important consequences. Now, naturally, um, this all went in parallel with um, other things such as, I don't know, the stories of the same house, like reading, I don't know, Levy. Uh, was a big deal for, say, writing uh, a history of, of the house of Bergen, let's say, because you would have a certain style that would look at the past and say, how did the great historians of the past write like, and how were the Romans depicted, and all, I want to be the same thing. Um, that's how they, they uh, that's where they drew the, their, their models from. Um, all this happens in a world that goes towards the, the printing, press, right? There had been more primitive systems before that really make you appreciate even more the the the, the availability of these works in the first place. The Pecha system, for example, was this copying system for farming out the copying of manuscripts that were fundamentally um, split into, I mean, not the the best ones, were these kind of more uh, ones you could ruin, let's put it in this way, and in fact were split in various quaternions that would be copied, would be lent to be copied for a certain amount of time and it would copy them all in a row yourself, with your, I don't know, with your servants, whoever, especially this was done for university students at the University of Paris as elsewhere um, we'll make a video about this more in detail, but um, there was a cyclicity with that, there was a certified origin of these uh, works because only the the university bookshop could sell those copies were the certified ones by the masters, so it was a very complex thing. Again, in a world like that, as you understand, that the main problem was perceived in being, um, you know, maintaining the uh, the, the the standards of the copy, like copying exactly what was in the original work, right? Because it was understood already in, in the starting of the past that some uh, copies had been corrupted, there had been grammatical mistakes, there had been just some parts were incomplete. So basically medieval civilization was recovering all of that, having to relearn how to, to properly even just write in a, in a perfect classical Latin at least and reconstructing history through that um, literally harvesting all these manuscripts in the various mostly cathedral chapters if you study I don't know the history of Petrarch that literally traveled all across Europe as an imperial ambassador 
um, in staying, like where he was staying somewhere. He visited the local cathedral school. He 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 heard of the, you know, sometimes he could access, sometimes he couldn't. But there were legions regarding out oh, there. I saw that there was that manuscript which was complete. They they still had to be fished out because again they had been reproduced. They had been. Uh, copied in, in in the Middle Ages, but not necessarily those who copied that were the ones who would simply use them, right? So what humanists began to do was to set this standard's full um, kind of uh, accuracy, precision, in the reconstruction of the original texts that really started um, the big deal of the probably of the philological issues. That 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 is something that began even before modern historiography to have, in fact, modern standards. Um, because by the time we were rediscovering the Middle Ages in the 19th century, in a proper sense, like, just philology was, was already quite advanced from from a substantial amount of centuries. So the humanists that were, uh, were already, like, doing a, a, a good job, and they were quite proper in that, by the way, so that some standards were sold after that author had managed to uh, I don't know, fish and reconstruct properly the uh, one of Kikero's works. I, everybody would run after that before, especially the printing press. Finding that book was a big deal. Somebody had to copy that. It had to be bought, to be moved. So just think about all the practical problems of spreading this, this knowledge information. That's why they were also concerned with these manuscripts, among the other things. Um... So availability, supply, price, it was all a business behind it. It was quite consistent economically wise. Um, there were also other means that to us may seem... Actually, we're, we're stopping to even read, so it's as if we didn't care anymore paradoxically, but things like indices, concordances, other finding tools, for example, for the Bible in the works of major authors, um, facilitate were, were, that facilitated the task of locating passages and authoritative citations were probably developed at this point, right? Because it was again a much thicker amount of of, of of information, and the way it was accessed was much more analytical than it had ever been done before, at least as far as we can document. Um, today we just rely on a digital that we hope is going to be there forever, but. Uh, you know, it can't be. Um, and uh, at some point, we will hopefully still have something in libraries, if these still exist, that we can access because uh, we can't just rely simply on on a certain type of technology. Already, in fact, the book is, you know, this one of the single most effective invention in in in, in the history of mankind because we still it's basically the same since it was invented. Um, at least from the early Roman Empire, we start having properly the book in the form we have, aside from the roles um, that we, from antiquity, that we're mostly familiar with, but that's when it began. Uh, and mostly, in fact, also in, in a Christian environment, right? Because literally, for finding the passages of the Bible, this huge work and having always with you, it was, was done at the time. So, some Bibles, I have some contemporary versions, let's say, or also other works, um, great for pieces of literature in in a tiny um, form, like you can. There are minimal booklets, right? But you can bring with you, and they are all complete. There were there were similar things uh, in the past, even with the means of the time. Naturally, without the precision, our printing machines and all the digital kind of um, you know detail we can acquire. But at the time, they tried methods. Consider that most of the stuff also worked with a much more developed. Uh, type of you know mnemonic uh, capacity that than today so uh, it was never just that work it was that within the context of something else um, very important of course were the flurry ledger in this sense so the extracts of certain specific works ecclesiastically speaking but mostly from the church fathers that um, thanks to this new finding tools could be consulted uh, also just knowing where you would find it you know with the chapters and everything with the standard system of reference marks to pages in a text again these things were all invented practically in the middle ages right because they were standardized systematized in the way we still use today exactly from medieval manuscripts 
Um, in this French context, we can compare the Quatuor Libri Sentenziarum by Peter Lombard, the Sicket Non of Abelard, um, the Gloss Ordinaria to the Bible that we mentioned before, um, with uh, the full, um, their full quotations of patristic authorities on each question or each passage of scripture um, to the new finding tools of the 13th century which tells you also again uh, as we were saying before for Gothic script and manuscript uh, as a whole how, how much of a boom in literary production had occurred nobody really understands what people mean when they say that the Middle Ages you know, people didn't read books, books were somewhere not to be read, or uh, the, people have no idea how how much was actually written at the time and used for practical purposes, administration, because at least just some books were, um, there's all a history of how even the manuscripts were reused at some time, they were it's typical for the modern age to have the cover of a or a page of a parchment, uh, say a, a parchment of a, from medieval manuscript used as a cover for book uh, for paper books, right? Overall, especially during the 13th, 14th century, the great crisis of monasteries, lots of monasteries got rid of some of the older manuscripts because they had the the copy of them in better ways, and and all this parchment went dispersed now. The same goes for most of the administrative realities, like for all the polities what we study of in on Schwerpunk. Like we don't have actually the we, what we know was used at the time as a support to, to write on, just to 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 regulate this world. So it's most of um, the actual written texts that 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 exist in the Middle Ages we have lost, right? Just like most books today, like who cares eventually to what a person has normally in a house? Because normally today we have a completely different way, naturally, of of treasuring knowledge, etc. But um, or at least um, just storing it. But um, there is a lot of written stuff, like the the I don't know the 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 books of the kids, all this you know the, what is written in school that it's not going likely to survive or even if, if it is it's at some point somebody's getting rid of it if there is no particular attachment or whatever like you know and sadly enough that this is what happened for millennia of written civilization of literary civilization of writing civilization um so for example peter lombard and his generation sought to at least they just the past, right? The idea that there were authoritative texts you could select special passages from that were considered more meaningful, right? So that you could eventually refrain them in, in a textual form and on other pages, um, reconciling citations from texts as they were preserved, even just reading them in synopsis was was all something, as you understand, it was functional to a specific interest they had at the time. Sometimes, literally, you know, making the fortune of a worker rather than another. Because, naturally, they already knew how, what, which ones were the most important, the most relevant, but, let's say, it's their view, right? Um, uh, also, the university masters of the th 13th century worked out a new way to approach texts in their entirety. Um, that changed a lot even just in the juridical thinking because it was a completely different way to to pose questions and to search for the answers by the way also in a much more detailed way you can you can perceive this when you grow up you think about what you studied when you were 8 then when you were 12 when you were 16 uh, the capacities change, the, the intelligence changes, the, the, the questions you're posing yourself, the way you're expressing yourself are changing, right? So civilization does. Um, in the 14th century, when you look at the library of the Sorbonne University, had lists of manuscripts in other libraries in Paris to render such lists available to those members of the college who may have wanted to know what was present at the Sorbonne without having, however, to go to the Sorbonne to read the catalogs. 
um, uh, which kind of makes sense. It's as if you know you have now a, a centralized uh, catalog um, nationally, digitally, and you don't have to literally physically go to the library to ask which where <laughs> book they have. It's it's the early version of that, right? So this is um, a quite important um, picture, which naturally uh, has um, it tells a lot again how close we are really to the uh, to to the same problems at the end of the day. Just the fact we still use books, which is a huge deal. Well, uh, it it still gets down to the fact that. Uh, we are uh, still very close, very similar to those same uh, ancestors of ours who pose themselves kind of with the same problems we, we have today, pose the same questions, want to know a bit the same things, right? And that is the point of history. When if you take a dislike into the, the way history is written, I think it's you're, you're an incredibly arid person. Right, because this this uh, obsession for I have to start conducting scientific experiments to explain history. But you have people who literally wrote what happened. I mean, uh, this sense of if something is not cent percent correct, I don't have to make the the mental effort to try to understand what this person was meaning. What do you think history is today? Right. If you don't do that, you can't understand history in the first place. But there are lots of kids that fundamentally reason like this right now, have been indoctrinated into this um, materialistic delusion. And, of course, do not believe anything. They don't have any value anymore, simply because, you know, how can you have any value if you don't even frame what is technically occurring uh, from from an, uh, you know, literally a, a spiritual point of view with the same kind of yours right it, and that, that is literally writing to you from from the past something that is very often much more reliable by the way than our say media broadly meant not the the terrible media that tire the, you know that you, if you are tricked by the media today you're an idiot right there shouldn't be anything you know humanly um worth in saying, you know, the media are lying to us. Well, are you so stupid with all the information available to not to understand wh how the media is lying and thus knowing what actually happens, but just actually informing yourself, just making two clicks and just accessing much more insightful info at least. Um, you're the weak one. You deserve to become what you're becoming, right? So just stop, just stop complaining about it because you're you're the one who's just responsible for that um, and at least have the decency to go in silence right that's the problem let, let the other people just taking over the world for you because you're too weak uh, to picture yourself in something different than victim of a terrible global conspiracy right that's exactly how people went under in history uh, because objectively they were worthless, and and that's how. And incidentally, they were the ones who didn't read, um, among the other things. And in any case, um, for today, uh, I stop it here. Uh, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like. Or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.